Let's uh, let's get get your coffee, your water, whatever you got. I have both. <laughs> Same. I that's that's why I sent that Zoom link slightly late. I was like, look, if I'm gonna be sitting here talking for an hour, I want to have a nice hot cup of coffee in front of me, and I'm gonna make totally it right. Totally fair. I am halfway through my second cup. <laughs> I'm really fortunate uh, that I, this is my first because I got a long day ahead of me. <laughs> so this will go a long way. Oh, I will say um, I went to visit my friend a few about a month ago and they introduced me to oat milk creamer. I oh. can't go back. Oh my God. It's so good. Like if you, if you like a sweet cup of coffee, but not like, you know, not like a, a like a Starbucks Frappuccino or something, but like. The flavored oat milk creamers are like they're sweeter than normal creamer by themselves, so I don't even need to add any sugar whatsoever. Just a splash of that creamer does the trick, and it's just it's delightful. <laughs> I I would consider it my problem. I actually just drink black coffee, and the reason that's the healthiest choice. <laughs> it is the healthiest. Uh, if you're gonna have a debilitating addiction to caffeine, this is the healthiest <laughs> way to go about it. Absolutely. Um, the thing is, like, creamer always gave me an aftertaste. Which I like really? kind of just sticks in your mouth and I constantly then I'm like I'm like doing that a lot because there's like that because that like fatty, you know, milk is still there. But with like I imagine with oatmeal creamer or uh not like oatmeal, almond milk oat, or something. Yeah, yeah. Oat, yeah. oat milk, almond milk, that it would be a little bit less, but I don't know. I don't, know. I don't have the guts to try it. <laughs> Can't drop those three dollars for a bottle. Yeah. <laughs> Besides, I kind of just now I, I've I've gotten myself to a point where I prefer the bitter taste. I've of tried. Like, I want to, and then like once every year or two, I'll go for like a week stint on just black coffee. But then I'll be like, I can have a little creamer, and I'll put like a little bit in, and then and I wean myself back to normal creamer habits. And the, I don't know. Yeah, the way <sighs> that I did it was I worked at Starbucks. Um, after I'd already worked other barista jobs, so I was familiar with, you know, like an initiation process for some barista jobs where you have to like drink a straight shot of espresso or something, yeah. which when you're a high schooler who's never done that before, it's oh. pretty, you know, it's a good, it's a, it's a decent initiation. Yeah. Um, but for Starbucks, it wasn't an initiate. It was like, here's what we call a coffee passport. You have to try all of the coffees in the store and you have to write about them all in this little booklet. Oh, my friend I'm, did that. Yeah, actually, yeah. I've totally heard that. And uh, like, it would we be fun start. To, yeah, they, well, they started me off with French press, French roast, no creamer, nothing. And, and I was that like, like the most concentrated. It's oh, it's so concentrated. But <laughs> but she's like, look, no, no, hold on. Uh, my my supervisor, she's like, try this, and gave me a hot cheese Danish, and holy shit. I never went back to cream and sugar and coffee because when you pair it with something like that, it's like the perfect thing to pair it with. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. that seems like something they, they really do to you at Starbucks because once my friend started working there, you know, he really did learn about all the different pairings and like the different notes and accents of different coffees and how best to serve them, which is mm -hmm. it's got it's a fascinating science to be sure. It's bullshit. It's all bullshit. <laughs> That's what I was uh, wondering. How like, similar is it to wine and stuff? <laughs> yeah, it's it's very much like there is there are differences, of course. Like blonde coffee is not the same as dark roast, but like it's so the differences are so minute between different dark roasts, unless mm. they're like l using literally like completely different flavors in the coffee, like flavored coffee, mm -hmm. that it, it's not really worth trying to describe. I feel like it's just splitting yeah. hairs at that point. Oh. Yeah, from my experience as a non-coffee aficionado, there is good coffee and bad coffee. Like, yep. for a while, I was drinking the, like, off-brand, store-brand coffee. And there is honestly a big difference between that and, like, the on-brand stuff. There's a reason it's so much cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, so once I think, I think right now I'm drinking, I think this is just New England brand. How do you make uh, your coffee? Uh, K cups, <laughs> K cups. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not. They're not terrible, but it's definitely sort of like 
I, that's like the lowest quality of coffee that I I like to drink. Like if I'm yeah, gonna, I'm I'm. I don't like having it. any like instant coffee or anything lower than than that. You I know tried, what I mean? I try instant coffee, and I, again, I'm like, this would be so easy, but it's it's never the right. Cons- it's not even the right consistency. You know, it's usually like you know, like very, normal brewing coffee adds a thickness to it. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's like, it's thin, Mm -hmm. and also, it's so caffeinated, it gives me the fucking shakes. Like, I don't, I don't (laughs) like instant coffee. It's, like, too much. I'm so tolerant to caffeine at this point, because I've bounced between coffee and energy drinks and everything for the last decade of my life, so, like, caffeine gets me alive. I no longer shake from it or anything. Yeah, I've had to wean myself down uh because i'm also i have adhd and i take adderall oh Um, how does that interact well you know when you take one stimulant you mix it with another stimulant you become very (laughs) stimulated uh (laughs) you're a very stimulated uh fellow so i got sort of used to when i started taking adderall and i was still drinking regular caffeinated coffee i was like fucking lightning i could i could make so much stuff i'd be so productive for like two days straight Mm -hmm. and then you know you get diminishing returns and i would just feel anxious and not be able to get things done Mm -hmm. and then if i stopped taking the adderall i'd go and i still this still happens it's like a like a, a day period of withdrawal where i'm just extremely low mood low uh pr- productivity like dopamine is like in the dump so i just can't yeah. bring myself to do anything um interesting that's actually exactly how i feel on days where uh so i take uh prozac just like a mm-hmm. tiny tiny little antidepressant like five milligrams a day um but yeah if i skip that and i skip my coffee i don't feel the effects until like mid to late afternoon but the mm-hmm. following day, oh my god, yeah, I'm a lump in my bed with no motivation, and I just sit there feeling sorry for myself. Yeah, and yeah, that's I've been feeling that way a lot lately, actually. Yeah. I lied a bit. You said, how are you doing? I was like, good, but actually <laughs> not really. <laughs> Mood, fucking public social mannerisms. Yeah, I'm fine, yeah. dude. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been kind of rough. I mean, Gen Con was amazing. I Gen loved Con Gen Con. Gen Con blast. Uh, and then I came back and like my room has been basically a mess ever since. And I had just mm-hmm. haven't cleaned it up. Um, and I think that's kind of fed into it a little bit, but also just like, by the way, none of this is making the fucking episode. We're just ch- oh, chatting. We're not going to start with, with coffee and depression. That's not the title of this episode. Coffee, coffee and depression. depression. <laughs> it would be a great title. Actually. <laughs> the thing is I've been, ch- I've been thinking about changing my format up, uh, ch- yeah. like, changing the titles of the episodes i think i'm going to start to you know what fuck it i'll do it with this one do we're going to call this episode coffee and depression and i'm going to cold open on this conversation awesome no context no context just Fantastic. just us talking and then <laughs> uh cue music now Welcome to podcasts and players. Thank you for sitting through that very long, unusual cold opening. I'm changing up the show. All right, I'm getting crazy with it. Uh, and with me today, you've already uh, heard him speak a little bit. This is a good friend, Brogan from No Nat Ones. That's me. Hello. I'm waving my hand, and you cannot see a thing. Welcome. Uh, I, I this is a very short introduction. Usually, I do like the whole like you know. Uh, Brogan does a channel about Pathfinder and uh, mostly second edition videos and blah, blah, blah. But a lot of people, I think, will already know who you are. But in case they don't, why don't you kind of give us the rundown? What do you what do you do on your channel? Uh, so I, as 
As Shane just said, I do cover Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Right now, I am in the middle of covering so much new content because Pathfinder in the last two months has gotten three completely new supplement books. So I'm trying to keep up and cover all of that. Um, when I'm not overwhelmed with new mechanics, then I, you know, I talk about the book, I talk about the mechanics, how they work, my thoughts on them, balancing, whatnot. When I'm not overwhelmed with new stuff, I like to do some comedy skits, I like to collaborate with other, with other creators, and really just do everything that every other TTRPG creator likes to do, because we're all very similar in this nerdy play-pretend game we all love. <laughs> yeah, and we're all anxious and depressed, as you now know. Uh, the curtain has been parted, and you see us for what we really are. Fucking lumps in our beds. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Except for when we manage to pull ourselves out and do stuff like this. Because it makes us feel better. <laughs> I am I am swaddled right now in a blanket in my chair. Are you <laughs> actually? Computer. Kinda. Like, well, if waist down and then I put on like a little sweat, like a zip up sweatshirt. That's um, adorable. <laughs> yeah, I'm very much... I, I don't get heating in, in my room. Oh, you don't have uh, any heat? I think the the whole like house has heat, but this room like we don't have heat in our apartment really. It's more oh, of like word. it's not central heating. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> it's there is like a heater somewhere in the basement, and there are vents in like the living room, and that's Yikes. it. Wow. Yeah, we're we're kind of lucky. We're on the third floor of an apartment complex, so we haven't had to turn our heater on yet because everyone below us turns their heater on and then we get the rising heat from them for free. <laughs> that is pretty nice. Kind of nice. Yeah, I uh, it's it, I'm living out here in the boonies, so it's <laughs> like right now, uh, you know, my if my Internet gets cut, it's because it's like windy and raining. Uh, but it's like very cold very early in the year and then it god i remember 2018's winter it was so cold it was like the negatives every day and i had to walk mm -hmm. to work i would walk outside and my you... eyebrows would stiffen walking to work in winter yes oh my i don't word. own a car that's awful i remember 2018 i was working at a cafe so i'd have to wake up at 5 a.m and yep. just the walk to my car and from the car to my job you know, like across the parking lot was torture. I can't imagine how far did you have to walk? Uh, a good eleven minutes. Ugh. I would I would get extremely like layered up. And I was working at a cafe at the time too. So like huh. I I would walk into like the town area and uh thankfully I didn't I didn't have to get up that early because it was like a mom and pop shop okay. where there's like one guy who owned it and he would always open. So like he opened nice. every day. But um Anyway, I digress. <laughs> There'll be a lot of digressing today, I feel. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a good conversation's good conversation. That's that's exactly. the long and short of it. But uh, let's let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, why did you... Why are you doing YouTube? Like, what the fuck, right? Like, what's up with that? <laughs> so, I was absolutely... I was the perfect age when YouTube was really hitting its stride, you know, I was 16 in 2011, so, you know, that was really when people started, uh, you know, YouTube was becoming a job. People were finding livelihood and stuff on YouTube, and namely, uh, Let's Plays were getting super popular. You know, your your Markiplier, I don't, actually, I don't know if Markiplier existed yet, but uh, people like Chugga Conroy, Proton John, Nintendo Capri Sun, they were people I aspired to be like. At that age, I had never even played D D or anything before but i did play video games and i watched people playing video games on youtube and i wanted people to watch me playing video games on youtube uh so there was a time when i was that awkward 16 year old high schooler who had no idea what he was doing making the cringiest let's plays on youtube and good god some of them are still out there on private and they're they're so bad <laughs> i mean that's an award in and of itself. Cringe. <laughs> Welcome to No Net Ones, the cringiest Let's Plays on YouTube. Oh, I wasn't that's... No Net Ones back then. That's... Was... I'm sure you had a different oh. name. You had to change it up, but uh... Game Boyer Seven Twenty One. Oh, now you're docs. Now everyone's gonna look it up, <laughs> including well, they me. They can find the channel. They've got there's there's some more recent stuff on there from like 2019, I think, because I overhauled the channel again. I have overhauled that channel multiple times and tried some other channels. Uh, no Nat Ones was actually my fifth 
and it was going to be my final time attempting to make content creation a career. Um, content creation to me have always had a very interesting relationship. Yes, especially you know in high school and college, it was definitely a hobby, but it was a hobby that I wanted to become a career. And between video games, hanging out with friends, hanging out with family, whatever, I didn't really have time for content creation to just be a hobby in my adult life. So ever since I was about 21, 22, I've really tried my damnedest to make content creation my career, make it my job, pay my bills, etc. Um, and I, I won't lie, it's it's been tough, you know, especially starting out, you need to treat this job, quote unquote, like a 40 hour a week career that doesn't pay you anything. You know, you need to give it all of the respect and all of the effort of a full time job with nothing in return. Yep. So um, I did that. Uh, but before before I was known at ones, I did live stream. I was uh, live streaming for my job for a while in early 2019 or late 2019, early 2020. I was live streaming on caffeine.tv, which is a streaming service nobody uses. And mm -hmm. when when I joined, there was some people. And two years later, when I left, there was some people, uh, but it, it never quite took off. So when I, I lost my streaming contract with Caffeine, I actually don't do this. Anyone who's listening, don't do what I did. It's stupid. It can get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, I took out a small business loan. Uh, I took advantage Whoa. of the national small bit. Like, so because of, of the virus and everything, the government was like, hey, if you have a small business, we will give you a loan. And I said, technically, this is a small business. Here I go. I, I made my known at ones channel about three months before I lost my streaming contract. So I took out a small loan and said, I'm going to buy equipment. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to use some of this money just to live off of. And if by the time I run out of money, I can't live like this, that's it. I'm not going to do content creation. I got lucky, you know, some of my videos took off. I got some traction and I was able to start making money. My Patreon did very well uh, and it saved my ass. Don't do that. <laughs> it's not smart, but um, it did work out. And that sort of led me to where I am now. You know, I dove into this channel head first. I took it more seriously than anything I'd done before. I, I took everything I learned from all my previous failed attempts. You know, every time you fail, you got to learn something. And luckily this time I applied all of that and I got lucky and I am like a C-list YouTuber, but it pays my bills and I'm very happy about it. <laughs> Hell yeah. Honestly, that's, that is, uh, not, I was going to say the dream, not for everybody, but definitely a dream that I, I would like to eventually reach one day. Problem is, is like, the thing you figured out is you knew what kind of content you wanted to make and you mm -hmm. could make it regularly enough that it would please the algorithm gods, you know? And so Absolutely. like... Absolutely. That's not, not super important. Oh, yeah. No worries. Sorry. Not, I, I don't mean to cut you off. I, I, sorry. I like to say things before I lose them because I lose thoughts really fast. Um, but on that subject of constant algorithm pleasing content, that's part of the reason I took out the loan. I knew... If I had to get another job and try to make known at ones work, the algorithm wasn't going to like me if I was putting out one or two videos a week. When I first started out, um, and I still try to do it now, uh, but I was pumping out three, sometimes four videos a week just to get that watch time, just to get those views and please that algorithm. And I firmly believe if I was not able to put out as much content as I did, I would not be anywhere close to where I am today. Yeah, it's it's tough. Uh, especially like I, I was going to say, like when, when you're an animator, it's a lot mm. more time intensive for a lot less output, you know, yeah. um, the mm -hmm. way that I've seen like friends like Ink and Aiden kind of doing it is they quick and messy, man. They don't, they don't waste time <laughs> on their stuff. They, they get an idea, they put pen to paper and just pump that shit out and it works. Like people like seeing that short type style content but i've always been a perfectionist and that's my downfall is like i take too long on my stuff 
but it's it is really hard. There was a time, probably like four, you know, four or five years back, in the rise of Odd Ones Out, the rise of Jaden Animations, all those big animators. I don't know what happened to the algorithm. There was a time when you know eight minute long animated life story videos topped the charts. Everybody saw them in everybody's recommended feed. And then they disappeared. You know, like those YouTubers are still doing well because they already have the audience. Mm -hmm. But I don't see animation in my recommended feed at all anymore. It's gone. Yeah, it's that is a. um, You know, now that you mention, I think there's some runoff from that because like so that was like 2016 because they changed the Mm -hmm. animation rules. Uh, It used to be shorter animations actually did very well. Uh, so you had a lot of people from Newgrounds who came to YouTube to put their animations on YouTube, and they did well. And then they changed the rules, and Ross O'Donovan made a video at the time about it, how like that's sort of bullshit, and it like suppresses animation. <laughs> so then you had, in response to that, story time animators who could make less, like lower effort animations that didn't have so much going on, but that were focusing on the story being told more than the actual animation. Yeah. Um, and so you could have longer content getting that view time. And so, like you said, it popped off because that didn't really... I mean, Domix and Swoozy were around, but they weren't doing it frequently enough, really, to make it sort of its own deal until uh, Jaden and, and Odd Ones Out kind of mm-hmm. corner the market. And obviously there's some others out there, too. <laughs> um, and then that blew up, and now that's sort of that's sort of like ironed itself out or like kind of like concrete's hardened now there is a there is a structure there that isn't gonna be kind of moved at this point exactly it's a it's a sub genre of youtube at this point you know that that still frame story time uh animation you know and like like you said yeah lower effort you know i don't i don't want to call them low effort because i'm sure they still take just hours and patience and whatnot but yeah, you know, they, they are easier to make, and YouTube likes them more. So, of course, that's going to be the, the standard fare. And I think the algorithm has shifted now because, again, uh, what is interesting changes over the years and stuff, and people have seen the story time stuff. Like, that that sort of movement has already come and sort of settled. And, like, obviously, yes. people who still like that, they're going to still watch their – just like Let's Plays. Like – Let's Plays mm-hmm. was a whole thing. All these new Let's Plays channels came out, and now there really aren't... I mean, there's lots of new ones coming out all the time, but like there aren't new ones that are getting a lot of traction generally. Uh, pe- Absolutely. People are just sort of like, oh yeah, I watch Game Grumps, or I watch Oni Plays. Right. And, or Mark. Or Mark, or, or Septicai, or whatever. So it's like, yeah, you know, you're kind of stuck with what you got. And like, yeah, you could go and look up new people, but like, it's the personalities that are interesting. Same with the story times. It's the personalities. There's only so many personalities you could get to know uh, right. as a consumer. But um, with the D&D animation thing, I was going to say there's some runoff there, too, because I think... Uh, thankfully, I think that D&D is an evergreen thing. Where, like, story time mm-hmm. stuff can get sort of old when it's, like, a lot of the same type of story, I suppose. Like, personally, I have no I interest in, like, uh, a lot of the story time animations that talk about, like, here's a story that happened to me at school. And it's like, I don't care. Right. You know? But I'm also a fucking 30-year-old man, so maybe that's part of it. <laughs> A lot of it does come down, like you said, to the personality. I know for me, at least, uh, when it comes to the story itself, I don't care quite as much. It's all in the presentation to me. Uh, it's it's about the person telling it, their comedic timing, all the stuff like that. And I, that's where I think James and Jaden really, that's why they cornered the market. They are charismatic. Mm-hmm. And so it was much more about how they told the story rather than the story itself. I think there's also some, at least for, like, Jaden, there's, like, a earnestness there that's appealing. Mm-hmm. Like, when, like there's, there's a sort of, like, trend that animators who animate, they're, like, quirky and introverted and stuff like that. And people really like that. But, like, there is a sort of, you know, that's, that's, that's almost a trope now at this point, right? 
Oh, absolutely. That's a trope across pretty much every subgenre. Like, because, well, because so many people on the internet are, you know, the shy, nervous, introverted types who can be themselves thanks to online anonymity. So those people who were able to overcome that and show that about themselves, so many people latched on because it's so relatable. Mm -hmm. Right. I think I tried to go for something different because I am actually very much an introvert uh, and I barely leave my house, but I wanted to kind of <laughs> sell myself as like uh, somebody cool. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you are cool. You're a cool boy, uh -huh. Shane. Man, and you're definitely not a natural failure, so you got the right name there. <laughs> no, there's no nat ones. <laughs> exactly. Um, I actually roll more nat ones than anybody I know, so it's kind of ironic. <laughs> you know, someone told me, I forgot who it was, but somebody said that, that every time you uh, you roll like a nat one in something that you get, you hear, you never hear the end of it. I think it was, was it Chuck? It probably, was probably Chuck, Chuck. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Love you, Chuck. Uh, anyway, we, oh man, digressed, I guess. I'll just finish up by saying that, like, uh, I think luckily because of the content that we make focusing on role-playing games, role-playing games are evergreen in that no two role-playing games are the same. There are a lot of shared things. Absolutely. One of the reasons why I haven't done the type of content that, like, Ink and Aiden do is because they cover, like, very short, relatable jokes that, like, everybody sort of, like you know can sort of like relate to on some level but like i've also mm -hmm. seen it done a lot of times right like i'm i'm i played so many of of those types of things that it doesn't make me laugh a lot and so i'm like well i'm not going to make anything that doesn't make me giggle like a fiend you know if i'm going to do like funny content but then that means I become a perfectionist with humor too. So then I end up not making any funny content at all. And then I'm just <laughs> not the funny guy. Like Aiden, who just has funny joke, haha, -ha, comes out and then boom, everybody loves it because he doesn't limit right? himself, you know? I that is an absolute mood for me. And and part of it comes I come across to my own self as an elitist because I'm like, oh, I could make this joke, but oh, it's it's too easy. You know, that joke is too easy. You know, too many people will get it or something like that. You know, and for some reason, I don't want to make the easy joke. And I don't know why, but part of me is like, oh, I want to be that 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 big, super clever innuendo, three layer deep wordplay joke. But that's not what people want I, that's what like a very small percentage of people will enjoy but people really do love just the haha that silly laugh he got hit on the head with a coconut yeah i mean there's there's something to be said about it all and i think th but i don't think there's anything wrong with not going for low-hanging fruit like seeing something really easy and seeing that knowing that this joke has been made a million times and thinking, how else could I approach this? That's healthy. That is a healthy approach to humor. Like, what else could I do with this that could be funny? That's not the thing that is my knee-jerk reaction. You know? Right. Um, comedy's, comedy's tough because it's so subjective. It is. Um, I, I, will, I will always defend the fact that comedy is harder than tragedy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It absolutely is. Timing is more important. Tragedy is like, mm -hmm. with uh, drama acting, uh, there's a lot more mm -hmm. room for interpretation and, and what you want to do to like display something. With comedy, mm -hmm. it's like it's less art and more science, I've noticed. It really is. Because with drama, the subject matter itself can often carry it up and forward for you. Whereas with comedy, it's all about the delivery. The subject, I mean, you can see stand up comics, they can make a joke out of almost anything. It's not necessarily the words they're saying, but how they're saying them. Mm -hmm. And that is just as true for really anything on YouTube. So much of it is not about uh, the content, but how you deliver it. Absolutely. This is a comedy masterclass with uh, Brogan and yep. Shane. <laughs> you can uh, find our paid classes for $100 a session in the description. This episode <clears throat> sponsored by nothing. Skillshare. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only. But uh, yeah, like I've, I've done, I've made some live action stuff in, in college. And, there, and there's mm -hmm. actually videos of me on YouTube for like, film festival stuff that people are really determined they might be able to find um <laughs> and it's like it was fun but like live action stuff i always was like i kind of need i need like an area to film 
and I also need like prop pieces and stuff and all sorts of things. And I'm like that. There's a lot of unspoken costs that go with that. Uh, and if you've oh, already are. got all that stuff, it's like you know it, it lends itself easily. But like when it's just me too, and I can't count on anyone in my real life to help me out with it, it's like ah, I'll just do animation because. With that, I don't need other people to be around. I can just represent whatever I need to represent with some drawings. That's that makes a lot of sense. Like there, there are definitely times where I'm like, man, I wish I had like a dedicated cameraman so I could do this crazy wacky bit with a camera like tracking me. But at the same time, I'm like, I don't like people being around when I record because for some reason I'm embarrassed of what I'm doing as I'm doing it. I don't know why. I'm an actor and I've always been this way. Like. Even when I was a kid in theater, I would not like to rehearse and run lines at home if my parents were home. Because in my brain, I'm like, but the, they'll hear me running lines. And for some reason, that's embarrassing. <laughs> no, I get that, too. I don't I don't I don't just don't like I'm that way more with like working out and exercising. I don't like people seeing me exercise because I feel vulnerable in that moment. Like I'm trying to better myself and my health and everything and someone can see me in this moment struggling to do that and then i feel weaker mm -hmm. somehow like like it's better to just not exercise and just keep my poise <laughs> but be <a> unhealthy <laughs> I think, yeah I, I think you've actually hit the nail on the head and explained something that i've been trying to figure out for a decade i think it's vulnerability i don't know why but yeah, I think when I'm rehearsing lines, when I'm recording a video, for, I do feel vulnerable. I don't know exactly why, but that is definitely the feeling. Yeah. And so you have you have unlocked something in my brain, and I appreciate I, that. Yeah, no worries. I think it's also like an art thing. Like when you have unfinished an unfinished art piece, you don't want to like show the world the work in progress if it's not done, right? Like you want to mm -hmm. unveil. It. Like here is the finished piece. Lots of blood, sweat, and tears went into making this happen. You know, the, but the behind the scenes magic, that's for me. That's not for you. Here's what you get to see and appreciate. And hopefully you see and appreciate it. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I absolutely feel that way. That's why uh, I've been looking into hiring an editor for my YouTube videos. And I actually have one who edits occasionally for me. But recording for an editor feels so different because, A, I don't want to accidentally say something that they're not supposed to hear. Because I'll, I'll talk to myself between takes of a recording, you know, and, and I don't want to give away like personal information or some important thing like that. <laughs> Whereas, you know, if I'm the one editing it, I can say whatever I want. I can cut it out easy. But like when I'm sending it to another editor, like I'll I'll be fully transparent. You know, I'll, I'll like burp between takes because I'm like, oh, no one's going to see it. I can burp. It's fine. Right. But then I realize I'm sending this to my editor and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> It's like, yeah, did you want me to keep in the part where you said that you hate women? Is that <laughs> is that all right? Do we keep that in or do you want me to cut that? Uh, which answer is worse? <laughs> I think it'd be funny if you just bleep women. Just bleep it and it'd be fine. Just bleep okay. women, let the comments fill in what they want. Man, I hate <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's the behind the scenes type of stuff is really interesting. So much. It's, it's insane. What I'm so curious about is you know i'm i'm at the point where i'm at and i'm already looking to hire like an editor and honestly potentially even a marketing manager at some point once i have the money for it but i'm looking at these people you know like like joe like jacob like logan and i'm curious i never hear anything about anyone working behind the scenes with them so i don't know if they're just one man armies or not i Which, um you know I, that's interesting i think in the case of jake i think Spencer does a lot with I think they're like a team so mm -hmm. like they because I know she she films those skits for the most part I don't know how yeah. much of it is editing by her or him or if they take turns or what the but I know that right. there's like a bit of like a, a teamwork dynamic there and then with Logan I think Logan just kind of does it on his own like he's a trooper <laughs> I can, I can Dabby. see that Dabby's the similar similar way no um, as for Joe, I know Joe does a lot of collaborative stuff with people, but I also know Joe is like a workhorse and will just do like ungodly amounts of work on his own. Uh, uh so I'm not, I'm really, 
unsure exactly like like basically i'm just this is a long-winded way of saying i agree with you and i don't know uh <laughs> i but oh, i do yeah. i, I do know that it's a lot less help than we, we than we'd expect i think is what i'm trying to say interesting yeah i am honestly i am envious of that workhorse work ethic because that is one thing that i absolutely struggle with is i'll get everything set up but I am such a sucker for A, procrastination, and B, distraction. And they usually go hand in hand. You know, I'll look at the clock and I'll be like, okay, I have six hours to get this video recorded and edited. Easy. And then I'll, I'll like open everything, get it all set up, and I'll be like, eh, I can play video games for an hour. I'll still have five whole hours to get this done. And then it'll be an hour later, I'm playing my game, and I'm like, I can play another hour. I'll still have four. And it just goes on and on until I'm like, why do I have 20 minutes left? And yep. it's it's really unfortunate. And I, I don't I need to figure out ways to to beat it because it does. It really limits my capacity as a creator. And it's easily my biggest flaw. I could do so much more high quality work and more work in general. But I shirk a lot just because there are days you know, similar to those days we talked about in the cold open, you know, where you're just feeling like a lump on the bed. It's so easy to say, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. Yeah, especially like, at least in my case, I, with ADHD, you sometimes physically just can't do it. Like yesterday was one of those days where I had things I wanted to do and I couldn't bring, I couldn't muster the attention span and mm -hmm. the effort to get some of the things i wanted to get done done i feel that like i was able to do a little bit of audio editing for like a couple animations i'm going to be doing soon which was something i guess and then like i got sucked into watching clips from terminators one and two <laughs> and then i wanted to recreate uh music from one of the scenes in terminator one and so i did that and so i felt good even though i had no intentions of doing anything with that music I felt good that I at least did something. I was somewhat productive in some capacity, even though none of that shit was stuff that I wanted. Like, I, there was another thing that I really needed to get to that I didn't, that I have to do either today or tomorrow instead, you know? There's definitely something to be said for completing things that are personally satisfying, even if they are not satisfying towards your work or career. Um... You know, there are ta there are days where I could easily make a specific video about a specific topic that I know will perform well, but if I absolutely need to, I will instead make a comedy skit or or some stupid little video. Even though I know it'll perform worse on YouTube, it makes me feel better because I have more fun with it. And I know if I force myself to just create this content because I have to, I'm going to start to resent the job and I don't want to do that. You know, I love this job and I don't want to get to a point. I guess I don't want to get to a point where this job feels like a job. You know, it still feels like a fun game related hobby. And I don't want to get to that point where I wake up in the morning thinking, "Ugh, I have to go edit this video because I do have days like that. And it's it's rough. It is. I mean, but that's also part of the reason why you're venture was successful is that you kept the fun in it it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like a job uh not to call out specific people mm -hmm. uh who i i respect but uh aaron hansen of game grumps oh. fame who mm -hmm. went by ego raptor back in the day right decided that he didn't want to keep doing animations right sure now, that's his decision. Some people are very salty about it, and they hold it against him, but it's not their fucking decision to make whether or not he say, yeah. animates, right? However, no when he started Game Grumps uh, back in the day, right? Like, it was a lot of fun. It felt like... I felt like he was like, oh, this is new and exciting. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. little bit silly, because they've seen Let's Plays at that point. But, like, he was really enjoying it with Dan and everything. I, st I like unsub from the channel and the reason I did was because it felt very corporate and it felt very samey. It felt like Nowadays. He, now he's just clocking in for a day on the job and that this isn't really exciting or fun for him anymore, especially because he's managing all these other subsidiary things besides that show that he's always like tired mm -hmm. and like 
it just wasn't interesting to me anymore because it's like, well, this guy's not having fun anymore. Exactly. And Danny's not really in control. He's just sort of on the couch. Exactly. So, like, Dan is being Dan. He does Dan things. He pretends he right. doesn't know how to play video games after doing nothing but watch and play video games for 10 years. Dan! <laughs> right. He generally doesn't play the games. It's almost always Aaron. And yeah. then it's like Aaron gets mad. Everybody goes, ah, it's funny. It's like, <laughs> look, I'm not, I, I don't dislike either of them. It's just, it's not entertaining to me anymore because it Agreed. doesn't feel like they're having as much fun as they used to. It feels like, mm -hmm. again, just clocking in for for the job. It's only interesting when they have a guest on because it's like, oh, God, brush a, breath, uh, a fresh breath of air. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, like somebody who isn't entrenched in this sort of same day in, day out type mm -hmm. of mentality, which maybe I'm projecting that onto them maybe that's not it at all and i'm way off the mark i you know? hey. don't think you're wrong i do agree with you because if you look two years ago you know two years ago they were still in that very samey every series kind of felt the same and hit those game grumps tropes but then they did the 10 minute power hour where you could tell they were loving it they were enjoying it doing things besides playing video games and you could see they were excited and happy to do it, and their reactions were mostly real, except for, like, the staged bits. Whereas, yeah, right. you compare it to their modern playthroughs, and it's a very different energy. It is, for sure. And, like, I've been getting a very similar feeling from uh, Super Mega. I don't know if you've you paid know attention them. to them. Yeah, yeah. Like, when they started out, I think it was very new and exciting, uh, and I think they've sort of... I, it's not quite the same. I think they enjoy their work, but I th also think that, like, they want to do other things mm -hmm. besides Let's Plays, and so we don't really see it a lot. And when they do do Let's Plays, it's not really... It's not as uh, hilarious as it used to be, and I'm not sure if that's just me getting tired of them as, like, hosts, or if it's just uh, they're not having fun with it anymore, which is my initial point, which was, like, you are still seeking to have fun with your content creation and i think that's the key if you're not having fun with it we the audience we pick up on it mm -hmm. oh absolutely you can tell when a creator is not enjoying what they're doing or if they're just doing it to get it done you know i'm sure there's a few videos on my own channel that come across that way because i know i made them like that and it's it's scary because if that happens enough for a creator you know, like you said, the fans will pick up on it. They will stop watching. That'll lead to a decline in metrics, which is just going to upset the creator who's already forcing themselves to do this. And it's really a downward spiral. And I've seen multiple creators, you know, shut down their channels because of it. It's sad. Yeah, it's one of the things I think uh, people are a lot more understanding nowadays because it's happened so many times. The The nature of doing content creation on a platform like YouTube means that you don't have a strict boss who's saying, I need pictures of Spider-Man by tomorrow. <laughs> like, you might have your own schedule that you're upkeeping, and hey, if you're as big as Game Grumps, maybe you actually own a business where you have a uh, upload schedule, but those will change. They're subject to change based on the condition of the people doing the work, right. and if they are like finding it hard to come up with fresh new ideas or things that they're passionate about it is very understand understandable and within the rights to like say we're gonna go on hiatus or we're gonna change this schedule up because it ain't working for us right now mm -hmm. like for example uh it's it just in our community uh whistle while you work she kind of got big doing like speed paints and she talked over the speed paints uh doing these like uh dnd stories that she mm -hmm kind of been through uh, a lot of times they were like horror story type moments but like she only has so many negative horror stories right and she's kind of gone through them all so she kind of st she stopped for a bit because she's like yeah i don't have any more like awful stories like i'm i'm out like i'm actually playing in some games that i really enjoy with people i really like like so i'm having a lot of fun now <laughs> yeah no abs it's it's that is the biggest downfall of building your brand around some kind of negative experience. And I'm not, I'm not like trying to throw shade or anything like that. I respect anybody who even attempts content creation. It's hard. But if you center what you do around negative experiences, one of two things is going to happen. One, you're going to run out of negative experiences because even though we think about them more, they are less common than good experiences. Or even worse, in my opinion, 
You are going to seek out and keep having negative experiences on purpose. So you keep having something to talk about and you're going to make yourself miserable from doing so, you know? Yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I think someone who has managed to make this work is Crit Crab. I was just about to say it. I was just about his experiences. (laughs) Exactly. Yes, you got me. Yeah, he because he does. It's not his stories. Mm-hmm. It's Reddit stories, but he does put work in in that it's uh well it's somewhat animated and he reads them himself. It's not he he puts it into a bot and churns it out on some sort of like fucking formulaic thing. It's like he stops, he pauses the thing, he has his own like, you know, lingo for his channel and everything. Like mm-hmm. he makes it his own. And uh, even says that there is work in just researching and finding good stories because sometimes people will make up shit. They'll like True. invent bullshit. So he has to sort of like find the ones that aren't made up that are genuine stories that have like a sort of, uh, you know, corroboration to them of some kind. Or at the very least, they're like consistent enough to be reasonably believable. Right. Right. And they still need to make a good story. You know, I'm sure there's tons out there of, you know, worst GM ever. He didn't let me take an extra feat. The end. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I will. I will say I have wanted to do something like that for so long, but I don't want to step on Crit Crab's toes and look like I'm trying to copy him. And that is what is so hard about trying to branch out. And and I've been told by multiple people, you shouldn't think of it that way. Like you're not doing the same thing as someone you're adding your own personal flair and whatnot, but it's really hard. You know, it's part of me wants to find a horror story and make a video telling it, make giving it that dramatic storytelling flair. But I guess part of me is scared of the, wow, you're just copying crit crab kind of comments, you know? Well, I mean, you might be able to find that stuff on, uh, I guess it, I, I don't know what the subreddit's called. It might be RPG horror stories maybe, but like, yeah, uh, if there's a Pathfinder variant, like let's let's get to like talking about that for a bit. Because <laughs> what Pathfinder? You that's do, like not it's not part of my brand at all. Yeah, you do Pathfinder <laughs> specifically as opposed to D and D five e because mm-hmm. everyone in the grandma is doing five e stuff. <laughs> uh, but Pathfinder is it's still very popular because Paizo is very good at what they do. Mm. But it's also always going to be second fiddle to D and D owned by wizards. Everybody knows it. You know, everyone's familiar Mm. with that. Yeah. Especially with things like stranger things and critical role in the last five years, nothing's going to compete with D and D anytime soon. It is at the height of its career. Absolutely. And it's only getting higher is the thing. It's like it, there's still, it's still even at its height right now. There's still such a small percentage of people in like mainstream, like the mainstream world that actually uh, is in like playing D and D. Right. That it is so much more room for growth there, right? And mm-hmm. and when I say D and D again, I also mean just like uh, Pathfinder and all the, these other role playing yeah. games in general. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Obviously, D and D is much more mainstream than it was, you know, 15 years ago. Um, and that I do mostly mean D&D, but I think the mistake a lot of people make, I think there's two big mistakes people make. The first is the thought of d and is the most popular. Why should I play anything else? Which, I mean, I guess if you enjoy it and you don't want to experience anything else, sure. But just because something is less popular does not mean it's inherently worse. Uh, the second one is not comparing different systems to each other there's nothing wrong with with comparing mechanics and having a favorite but i think it's also important to look at every system out there and not just D and pathfinder but call of cthulhu shadow run uh dragon age all of them and look at their merits on their own rather than trying to compare them people seem to have this idea that you can play one system you're allowed to say you like one system and no more when in reality, you can play whatever the heck you want. You know, right now, weekly, I'm playing a Pathfinder game, a 5e game, uh, two Pathfinder games, a 5e game, and a 3.5 game every week. I'm playing three systems a week, and I love all of them for different reasons. 
you know, 3.5 really has that classic D&D mechanics feel. There's some fun things to toy around with and manipulate, uh, whereas 5e has that nice simplistic mechanical rule set. I can get much deeper into my character because I don't really need to worry about the rules pretty much at all. And then Pathfinder 2e has a really nice balance where I get to think about my character, think about my players, play around with all the different toys Paizo has invented with all the different feats and items and monsters and everything they've done with it. And they all serve a different purpose. And I think it's been kind of toxic when people are like, this system is arbitrarily better when that's not true. (laughs) I am so glad to hear you say all this because it really is the truth. I started with Pathfinder first edition. Okay, cool. And uh, classic D&D. Like, for people who don't know, Pathfinder 1st Edition and 3.5 are almost identical in many ways. There's just very, there's a few differences uh, between the two systems, but like, they're almost the same. Same base. And like, yeah, yeah, same same core mechanics and stuff. You can easily convert something from one to the other and vice versa. But uh, with, with Pathfinder and 3.5, it was the classic, this is a game, yes. right? Like... This is, we are dungeon crawling. We are uh, fighting things that that are deadly. People die every other session (laughs) and then make new characters and come back with, and so no one gets super duper attached to their characters unless they've been with them for a while, you know? Like, the, the backstory thing, it's like, yeah, we wrote backstories, but like, we were very, like, ready for characters to be killed unceremoniously and then have to make a new character. You see, interestingly, I don't think that's system dependent. I think that's 100% table dependent. My 3.5 game has been incredibly, you know, there have been some dangerous situations, but honestly, my 3.5 game does more role play than combat. We maybe fight once every two months. Other than that, it's been entirely role play focused. You you might be right in that. I just I know that the system does lend itself to character death more. It's more unforgiving because, and I, I described this on a previous episode with um the voice actor I had on Spencer. Uh, he was talking about how he likes Pathfinder, and I was saying, and he told this really crazy story of like a, a T Rex doing a sonic roar that liquefied <laughs> a bear, and I'm like, that's such a Pathfinder thing. Because, like, there's a, like, for example, badgers. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a beast, a little animal, right? Yes. Uh, in 5e, it's nothing. It's absolutely nothing and can be easily dispatched, uh, even at level one. It's not really going to be much of a danger to you. Uh, in, pa- like, Pathfinder 1st and 2nd edition, badgers have, like, barbarian rage and deal a fuck ton of damage. And you can easily be killed by badgers in that system and like that's very common across the board where there are a lot of seemingly oh i can handle this type of situations that are very much not like that at all and they're <laughs> extremely dangerous and they don't seem that way like i had a character that was like uh water genasi or i guess she was an undyne in that system and uh she got um torn apart by a crocodile uh, just absolutely fucking demolished. She was like a monk and had all this cool shit and just none of that shit like could help her against this crocodile <laughs> that killed her very quickly after I made her and it was very disheartening and I was upset. <laughs> That's sad. Um, yeah, but it's like that system, maybe you're right, maybe it was my DM or whoever just ran it more unforgiving. It's very possible. When we, tr- but the same group though transferred over to 5e and 5B, almost nobody dies. And I think that's because the system is a lot more forgiving with, like, healing between rests, for yep, example. Yeah, because 5E sets you to full health on a long rest, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, because of its simplicity, it's really easy to kind of figure out ways to just not get killed. Right. In fact, I played, a, I played a fighter. At one point, I was trying to get myself killed, and I couldn't. I was too <laughs> invincible to be killed. And I was, like, hoping that my DM would send a deadly, like, hyper-deadly encounters. Like, I think he at one point sent uh, an adult dragon at us, but he made it at half health. And I was, like, gripping my head, like, why didn't you just send it at full health, man? Just let me die. <laughs> let me die in a blaze of glory, damn it. Oh, man. No, I, I will say, the older editions were definitely more lethal, especially if you played them 
rules as written. You know, anything can be homebrewed. Uh, in my so about five years ago now, we played. So it, it wasn't D and D first edition. It also wasn't advanced D and D. It was known as D and D Black Box. Are you uh, familiar with it at all? No, I've never heard of that. Uh, so when. When first edition D&D was pretty much done, two companies were actually given the rights to make them. Uh, one of them made a D&D and took off a lot more. Uh, the other one made what's called D&D Basic, which was like a box that you purchased and had everything in it you needed to play. It was completely unaffiliated with uh, advanced D&D, but it had a lot of the same things. You know, it still used FACO. It still used all the original saves. It was much more similar to first edition, whereas a D&D changed a lot. Uh, I guess you can almost think of it as Pathfinder and 4th edition in differences. But, mm. you know, we followed the rules to AT. Our level 8 wizard, you know, wizards only got a D4 hit die, and he had a negative 1 constitution modifier. So when he leveled up, he typically only got 1 or 2 hit points per level. So they're level 8, and he has, I think, 14 hit points at level 8. And he... You know, we've been playing this campaign for six months, and he happens to get targeted by a spell that does 3d8 damage, and I happen to roll 24. So he took so much damage, he went past negative con modifier, which rules as written, is instant death. Like, that doesn't happen in 5e. What, what, what's the rules for 5e instant death? If you take more than double your max HP, you die? No, you gotta, you have to take an amount of damage from one source that exceeds your uh, max hit points after reaching zero, essentially. Okay. So, like, so if you're, if you had, say, 14 hit points was your max, and you were at two, and then someone hit you for 16, that would be instant death. Gotcha. But that's, that's still so hard to do. You know, once you're level 2 or 3 and you've got 20 plus hit points, you know, nothing at that level is going to hit you for 30, 40 damage unless it's way higher level than you. Right. Or if you fall from a high height or something. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard it as a common complaint. But yeah, past level like 3 or 4, death is not a concern in 5e. And I absolutely feel that unless you're fighting some crazy things. But what's also so funny is how imbalanced and easy it is to die at, like, level one in 5e. Have you ever heard the giant crab and commoner comparison? Uh, I have not, but I, um, I, I sympathize that level one sucks. Yep. I'm not a fan of level one in almost any edition unless it's going to be this grand epic campaign. That's fair. Um, and 5e, it's like... It's so simplistic, the, the system. It's like level one is torture to play. I, I absolutely hate it, and I yep. refuse to do it from <laughs> this point forward. The, uh, b before I lose it, the, uh, the comparison, uh, the giant crab is a level one-eighth challenge rating. Um, mm -hmm. And a, a normal humanoid commoner has four hit points. The giant crab, if it lands a hit, deals 1d6 plus one. That is an average of four damage. So if a single giant crab lands a hit on a commoner, they are probably dead <laughs> in one hit. I always thought the four hit points thing was kind of stupid. That's I have so some, uh, I have some civilians in a game that I'm uh, DMing or waiting to DM. We've been on a hiatus because our schedules aren't uh, agreeing at the moment. But mm -hmm. the I have civilians, civilian NP NPCs that are like, you know, important to the story in some way or, uh, or form, but like. No way in hell am I giving them four hit points. Like, that's stupid. I, I gave, yeah. I think the lowest is nine hit points, and the highest is like 18. Yeah. Uh, I like what Pathfinder does, where it basically says, any, if the GM has full discretion, whether zero hit points on any creature is death or death saving throws. And that makes mm -hmm. more sense. You know, if an NPC, if they have low health, at least they can still make death saves to keep them around and then you know if they fail their death saves and get myrtleized then sure maybe they just weren't meant to survive but you don't get any of those just instant okay they're dead okay they're dead yeah but uh, with so so with pathfinder like i'm actually playing in a 2e game right now oh cool uh yeah it's a it's like a stream game every friday and i've noticed with 2e since we haven't really talked we've been talking about like uh, older <laughs> editions and stuff yeah I it's definitely more complex. I don't want people out there to think that this is like as simple as 5e. It's definitely yeah, not. Yeah, compared to 5e, absolutely not. But it's also once you understand the core differences, it's not hard to figure out. Like, yeah. 
the the most complicated thing for me was building a character because mm -hmm. I was having trouble figuring out numbers like how to like how you determine ability scores starting out and like all this other stuff because it's in the book I have the uh the core rule book it is not it clearly is described <laughs> character creation it is I, extremely convoluted and they yep. could have easily streamlined the explanation without changing any rules and they didn't and that yeah so for some reason the skeleton of like the step by step how to make a character is in the middle of the create a character chapter not at the beginning not at the end it is in the middle so unless you are flipping page to page and looking for it you're not going to find it the core rule book is terrible and will have you flipping back and forth and back and forth trying to find things yeah archives of nethys is your friend yep yep <laughs> archives of nethys it's like the there for first edition pathfinder the the, the pfsrd uh, that you can find mm -hmm. online, and that was the sort of online resource for all that. Archives of Nethys is the 2E version of that, which has all the spells yep. you'll need. Like, like you were just saying, this past couple months they released new stuff, so I was like getting ready for my game, like, alright, what spells am I going to prepare? I'm a cleric, and I'm like, I've never seen half of these spells. Where did all these spells come from? I'm like, oh, Secrets of Magic. That's a new thing that they released. Cool. I've got like all these new spells I'm able to prepare. So like, I don't, no. I didn't need to like, I'm not saying people shouldn't buy uh, the the materials. I think that that's totally awesome and it supports the um, the game makers. But like, mm -hmm. it also lets me know, like this SRD does, when they come out with new stuff, and then I can determine, oh, this is really cool. Maybe I should buy that. And that's what's a, that's a very fascinating aspect of Paizo as a company. They've almost sort of become a buy our stuff if you want to support us company, which has its merits. You know, being able to play these games for free is incredible. But as a company, that's also really dangerous. You know, they're going to lose out on a lot of potential sales because a lot of people are going to say it's all online for free. Why would I buy a book? Yeah, I, I still I like that business practice though, just because it's D and D Beyond came out right, and mm -hmm. I understand <laughs> why like it was sort of like necessary to have it in this digital age we live in, but I have I own the books I bought the books I have their ISBNs or whatever like their little codes in the back. I cannot register the books that I own on D&D Beyond. I have to buy them again in order uh, to get them on there. And that is the dumbest shit in the world. Wizards, if you're listening, I, I, please don't hate me. I would love you to sponsor me. But that <laughs> shit is dumb and you know it. You it's absolutely ridiculous. know it. At the very least, give like a hearty discount or something. I think they it's do insane. give some. They give do a they? discount, but it ain't hearty. Because it's, it it's, still, it's like one. 30 bucks a book on D&D &D Beyond, right? The only one I've ever purchased is Tasha's so I could re review it on stream. And they don't even give you a PDF. Yep. I, I can't get beyond behind that. That's what's ridiculous to me. Like, you don't get a PDF of the book you bought. You just get access on the website. It's ludicrous. And look, I, I buy the books in person. I, I support Wizards of the Coast, even though their business practices are not necessarily agreeable all the time. I love having these books, right? I like having that collection. Plus, mm -hmm. I like being able to just like, instead of having to like look it up and depend on my internet connection, which sometimes can fuck up, I can just have the book here. D -d 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 exactly. All right, here it is, you know? Yeah. Anyway, look, time has flown by. It's already been over an hour. Uh, let's let's wrap it up. Why don't you tell all everybody right. where they can find you? All right, all right. So so primarily, obviously, you can find me at youtube.com slash ones. That is where I do most of my stuff. N-0-N-A-T, the number one, the letter S. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at ones. Those are my two big places you can find me where I post stuff. Uh, I also have a website, knownatones.com, if you want to check out some cool art that we've been working on. Uh, that's sort of been our biggest project lately. We just uh, released a, an official Known At Ones merchandise line featuring unique, iconic characters that we've created as a team. They're all super cool. Check them out at knownatones.com. Uh, my big project, and this hasn't been announced anywhere else. I don't know. Is, <laughs> I don't, is this going to be out by the start of November, this episode? Um, by November? I mean, this is probably going to be out during november 
but During not November. like okay. before November. Then we are currently in the middle of Nonat November. And yes, the name is on purpose, uh, which is sort of a big project I'm going to hate myself for doing. Uh, but I am currently in the middle of releasing one video a day for the entire month of November. Ooh. We'll see if I get through it. If this comes out in the middle of November, you'll be able to see if I've stuck to it or not. But yeah, that's the plan. 30 or 31, however many days are in November. That many unique videos all in one month. It's a terrible idea, but that's my big project I'm working on right now. So goodbye, free time. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you for coming on, Brogan. I really appreciated having you. Thanks for having me, Shane. This was a blast. It was nice and comfortable. This is, I, I love this. This is kind of my favorite interview, quote unquote, question mark. My favorite kind of thing to do is where I just get to sit here with someone who has the same hobby as me and just shoot the shit, you know? It just, it, it's nice. It is absolutely <laughs> nice. Thank you.